My name is Sen Jacob Tai. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today's video is entitled, I Hate Pills. Now, this is a bit odd coming from a, a doctor who's, uh, who um, is a pill pusher, essentially, and it's, um, it may seem at odds with what I do, but um, let's get on with the video and you'll understand where I'm coming from. Now, one of the biggest banes of the lives of patients is, that the, is the number of tablets they have to take, and that number always, only ever seems to go up. Rarely do we come back from the doctor with less tablets than what we went in with. I know some patients who have to take as many as 30 or 40 tablets every time, and the very thought of that sends shudders down my spine. I've seen it with my own father. He starts retching when we give him all his tablets. It is horribly distressing to see. The very thought of getting older and sicker terrifies me for this very reason. We as doctors are very quick to prescribe tablets, but rarely ever see how inconvenient and uncomfortable it must be for the patient to have to take those tablets. Each tablet comes with its own costs, both financial and in terms of side effects. When a patient develops side effects, rather than really appraising whether the medication is truly worth giving, we just get on and give the patient more medications to counteract the side effects. We feel happy that we have managed to do something so that we can get the patient out of the door as quickly as possible without having to do too much brain work. The pharmaceutical industry licks its lips in delight because they are selling more product. The insurance company employees give each other a fist bump because they can now raise premiums. And all this happens at the expense of the central and supposedly most important figure in this equation, the poor patient. When this poor patient finally musters up the courage to challenge why they have to take all these medications, they're often met with a curt response because they are good for you. And if you don't take them, it is likely something bad will happen to you. And so with this fear freshly instilled in their mind, the patient is sent on their merry way with an appointment to come back in six months. The patient will then continue to take the tablets, feel completely helpless, continue to suffer, and will never ever even know whether they have benefited from some of those medications. The reality is, that this answer, because it's good for you, is an easy answer to give. It's a cowardly answer to give. Most doctors give medications because they have been told it is good for the patient. Most doctors have no idea how good, and even more importantly, whether what they know about the supposed goodness of that medication can be extrapolated to that unique patient in front of them. This, to my mind, is bad medicine. Whilst medicine is commonly seen as a science, the practice of medicine should be an art. What we should be doing is seeing the patient as a whole being and not as a list of diagnoses. We should understand that more important than any tablet is the level of rapport and trust that they share with their doctor. When a patient asks us, why they have to take a particular medication, we should really try and evaluate exactly how beneficial that medication would be for that specific individual. And we should take into account their unique situation, their age, the impact that the medications are having on their quality of life, and most importantly, their wishes. Then we should always give the patient the choice and say, these are what the data say, these are what the numbers are. Do these numbers work for you? And if the patient says, yes, these numbers work for me, then you have a more empowered patient who can own that decision to take that tablet. And if the patient says no, then again, you have an empowered patient who feels like he's made a decision that is best for him or her. And we need to learn to respect that. It should always be about the patient. We should always give them that respect that they deserve. One of the things I wanted to do on this channel is start presenting what we do know about commonly used cardiac medications in a manner that makes sense to patients. Here is a general common sense based template that I devised to use when we think of pills. Okay. Now, the first thing to say is all pills should either improve quality of life or quantity of life or ideally both. 
quality of life and quantity of life are the only two important endpoints. Don't take a medication that lowers cholesterol. Take a medication that makes you live longer by preventing a heart attack. And if it does so by reducing cholesterol, then all well and good. But don't take a medication that reduces cholesterol, but that has not been shown to prevent heart attacks. So the first thing to ask is, why have I been prescribed this pill? If it is for quality of life purposes, then that's easy because you will know if your quality of life has been improved by that pill. You can stop the pill and see if your quality of life, which incidentally should only be measured by your own yardstick, gets worse. If the pill has been prescribed for quality of life and it doesn't improve your quality of life, then clearly there's no merit in taking it. The problem is when a pill is prescribed for mitigating risk of something bad happening to you or for improving lifespan. In this setting, the, the problem is that you will never know if the pill has truly made you live longer or prevented something bad from happening to you because you will never know for sure what would have happened if you weren't taking the pill. And so the only way to know is to look at data from studies in populations of patients just like you to see whether a population of people like you who were given the pill lived longer than a population of similar patients who were not given the pill. And when you have the data, perhaps the most important question then to ask is how many people lived longer and for how much longer? The second question to understand is what is your risk without the tablets? So that you have to know what your risk is before you take the tablets to know whether it's even worth reducing that risk further by taking the tablets. Here is an interesting analogy, okay? Let's say someone comes to you and says, please buy this lottery ticket, because if you do, you may win this massive jackpot. Your first question before investing your hard-earned cash should be, what are my chances of winning? At that point, the honest answer to your question should be, well, we are selling these tickets to a million people, so theoretically your chances are one in a million. And at that point, you can make a decision whether that is an investment you will be willing to make. It goes without saying that you would be much more likely to invest if your chances were one in 10 compared to one in a million. The dishonest answer, which most drug companies will give you, is, oh, it's not important how many people bought, buy the lottery ticket. The more important thing is, if you buy two tickets, you will double your chances of winning. So if a medication is purported to reduce your risk of having a heart attack by 50%, you need to know what your risks are of having a heart attack in the first place before deciding to take the medication. If your risk is one in a thousand, then the potential benefits of the medication may be negligible. If your risks are one in 10, then a 50% reduction suddenly seems very attractive. So the next question is, what determines your risk at the outset? And to my mind, the single most important thing that increases your risk is if you have already suffered an event beforehand. So for me, a person who has already had a heart attack is always at a much higher risk of having another heart attack. If a person has had a stroke, they are far more likely to have a second stroke. And this is why you are prescribed a medication this is why when you're prescribed a medication, you should know whether this medication is being prescribed for primary prevention, i.e. to prevent a first occurrence, or for secondary prevention, i.e. to prevent a recurrence of something that has already happened at least once before. The risk of recurrence is always higher without treatment than the risk of an occurrence, and therefore the benefits of pills are likely to be higher when used for secondary prevention rather than for primary prevention. There are other risk factors too that should figure into the decision-making process, but most important is whether something bad has already happened in the past or not. The third thing to evaluate is the risk of harm from the medication, and again, based around Quantifying that risk, one can decide whether the potential benefit is worth taking on, is, uh, whether the potential benefit is worth taking on the risk of the potential harm. Finally, we need to also to know how long we may benefit from the potency of that particular medication. It is not always the case that if you continue to, to take a tablet for the rest of your life, then you will continue to achieve the same 
potential benefits for the rest of your life. A 30-year-old patient who is likely to benefit from statins is highly unlikely to achieve the same benefit when he gets to 90 and the side effect profile may change as the patient's body begins to change. If you've had a heart attack, then your risks of recurrence will be higher in the first month, first few months or first few years, but with time that risk will drop and therefore again it's always good to re-evaluate whether the pill you were prescribed several years ago is still beneficial or not. Unfortunately, no doctors do this. It is too much hard work. This is where I would encourage all patients to challenge their doctors to review their medications with these specific questions in mind. When we're armed with this information, we can make a much more measured assessment of whether that particular tablet is for us or not. This is what patient empowerment should look like. When we feel empowered, everything becomes that little bit easier. Now my next video will be on the subject of aspirin and in this video I will try and use this template and present the data around aspirin for prevention of heart attacks. Uh, once again, thank you for all your kind messages of support. I hope you found this useful. I really appreciate you more than you will ever know. Thank you.